My name is Peter Davison, and I've always loved classic cars. It's just an elegant way of travelling. I'm Christopher Timothy. I have a passion for history and Britain's great heritage. I just like finding out about the past. It's intriguing. We've been friends ever since our All Creatures Great and Small days. Just take it easy, will you? Relax, Jim. Enjoy yourself. Woo! Hit the first gear. Now, 40 years later, we're returning to the golden age of motoring and setting off on a series of classic road trips, 1930s style. You see the map in your hand? That's for navigating. Yeah, but it's, it's we not, don't have a sat nav. We don't have any other means of it's finding not as easy as all. It's not as easy as all that. We'll uncover incredible historical secrets. Fantastic. <laughs> it's fascinating. It's fascinating. <laughs> we'll tackle the toughest driving challenges we've ever faced. Take it easy, buddy. And meet some truly remarkable people. Oh, yeah. You are what real heroes are, aren't you? You're the genuine <laughs> article. An absolute privilege. And me. Thank you so you. much. <laughs> Hats on, roof down, home, James. Today, we're making a very special homecoming journey as we travel on our own Harriet Trail from Scarborough to the villages of the Yorkshire Dales, where we filmed all creatures great and small. For both of us, it was a sort of turning point, wasn't it? That's where it began all those years ago, isn't it? Magical times. Yeah. Along the way, we'll uncover Yorkshire's rich motoring history and meet its unique car enthusiasts. If it was too pricey, it'd have been, they'd have been saying, how much? <laughs> we'll tackle one of the county's most extreme roads. OK, Chris, we're going to give this beast a go. And at the end of our adventure, we'll be sharing a very personal and fantastically nostalgic drive. Fetch your spin. Why not? But before we can do any of that, I need to meet up with Chris on the glorious Scarborough seafront. This is the iconic journey that Chris and I were always destined to make because this is Scarborough and Scarborough is where we would often head on our weekends when we weren't filming and this time by way of variation we're going to do that journey in reverse so we're going to start here and retrace our steps back to the heart of the Yorkshire Dales it's going to be a trip down memory lane quite a long memory lane actually I think the journey is a little short of 100 miles could be a lot longer with Chris as my navigator, but that's all part of the fun. I'm meeting Chris in front of Scarborough's iconic Grand Hotel, one of the earliest spa retreats in the country. Built in 1867, it was designed to have 365 rooms, 52 chimneys and 12 floors, all representative of our calendar. Most important. This hotel is where my namesake, the real James Herriot, first fell in love with Scarborough. During the war, Scarborough's Grand Hotel was commandeered by the Royal Air Force as a cadet training centre. One of its recruits was Alf White, better known as James Herriot, who went on to write a bunch of pretty popular books about life as a Yorkshire veterinarian. During wartime, every morning at 6am, Alf would take part in some pretty gruelling PT sessions on this very beach and slept on uncarpeted floors up there. But in spite of all these hardships, he fell in love with the place and he vowed that he would bring his children here on holiday. And he did, year after year. The Grand Hotel is the perfect place to start our nostalgic journey back to the Yorkshire Dales. <laughs> yes, the fun and game. Oh. How is it? <laughs> the car? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Good. good to see you. Yeah. I think individually we're very serious items. But yeah, I Together, agree. we're sheer comedy. Because <laughs> it's almost impossible getting in and out of the car. Our trusty companion for our homecoming journey is a Morgan 4-4. Designed in the mid-1930s, it's the longest-running production car in the world. With a 1.6-litre engine, wire wheels, and a sleek, handcrafted body, it definitely looks the part once you've managed to clamber into it. I'll now demonstrate the Morgan hat removal system. <laughs> Favourite bit, this is. 
<laughs> oh. Here we go. Yeah, can't right. wait. Still. <laughs> Actually, once you're in, it's quite comfortable. It's better, too. Because we'll never get out. No, it's, oh, it's lovely. Travelling from east to west, our journey will take us out of Scarborough via a short detour on the North York Moors. We'll travel through picture postcard countryside before arriving in Langthwaite in the Yorkshire Dales, where a unique and exceptionally special driving experience awaits. So, Chris, we're back on the road again. We're going on the Harriet Trail. Oh, fantastic. We're blazing our own Harriet Trail. It's a trip down memory lane. Yeah, I can't wait. It'll be great. When we first came out, do you remember that? First, I think we had an eight-week block of filming. Yeah before we actually started in the studios. It, uh, uh, and I remember driving up the A1, uh, which I'd done before on my way to Scotland, but never turned off it. And then turning off uh, the A1 at Beedale and just seeing this glorious countryside that I had no idea was there. Um, absolutely. Staying away from motorways and dual carriageways and using maps instead of sat-navs, we're going to be travelling 1930s style through the legendary scenery and countryside that has played such a large part in both our lives. I, I do consider myself now to be an honorary Yorkshireman. I've decided that. I don't care if the Yorkshire people don't want me to be. I'm, that's what I am. I'm now an honorary Yorkshireman. I agree. As we head out of Scarborough, breathtaking scenery lies ahead some of which was described in almost Yorkshire-like forthrightness in the 1930s guidebook, Car and Country. The incomparable Yorkshire moors, which have a new face every day for every traveller, to Carlisle and from there to Barnard Castle. Nobody in possession of their senses could object to that. If they have, let them sell their car and buy something which will keep them at home. They do not deserve the freedom of the King's <laughs> Highway. That must have been written by Yorkshireman, wasn't it? I, I would imagine. <laughs> this is God's own country. And even if it's not yours, it's still almost in this beautiful Are place. they saying God was a Yorkshireman? Almost certainly. Hmm? I think what they're really saying is that uh, of all the places that God created, this is the This was his, his number the, pinnacle, one. the pinnacle. Absolutely. They are hugely proud, aren't they? They are hugely proud, yeah. unashamedly belligerent to their pride in them. I like that about them. Yeah. Meeting its people and exploring Yorkshire played a big part in making filming All Creatures Great and Small such a fantastic time in both our lives. Now we're discovering the place all over again. And just under half an hour out of Scarborough, we're turning off the road to delve into a little known slice of the county's motoring history. Just going to turn right yeah, into exactly. here, Chris, because it's very grand. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, we're popping in here to Wycombe Abbey to see a man about a tractor and a lady about an Aston Martin, which is, of course, a James Bond car. <laughs> The Aston Martin screeched onto the big screen in the 1964 Bond film Goldfinger. The DB5's 4-litre engine put out 252 brake horsepower, and it had a top speed of around 145 miles an hour, but it owed a large part of its success to some Yorkshire tractor engineers. We've come to the impressive Wycombe Abbey to find out more. Look at that, look at that. Bayek. Bayek is like. We're here to meet Lady Diana Down, the president of the Aston Martin Owners Club, and Adam Brown, the grandson of entrepreneur and tractor manufacturer Sir David Brown, who bought Aston Martin in 1947. Hi, Peter. Hello. Diana. Hello. Hi there. Nice to see you. Thank you. Good. Welcome to Wycombe. Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, we're, we're very common people, so we don't want to do this right. So, uh, how would you like to be addressed? Diana. Diana, that's fine. That's great. Tell us about your enthusiasm for Aston Martin cars. Well, the first time my husband took me out in his DB24, right. I didn't know what an Aston Martin was. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that's true. Right. Then we started racing and one thing and another, and I did, well, went with them all the time. 
So did you do actually race yourself? No, I was thinking of racing when my husband did a bit of club racing. I thought I'll go yeah. because I'll be so frightened that I must club race. But in fact, then he bought faster cars and better cars <laughs> and I finished up just doing the timekeeping. Oh. And now you're the president of the Aston Martin I'm owners president. Club. Yes, my husband was president before me. I see. You get a car along with that. that uh, the, the I wish I had. <laughs> that would have been really nice. <laughs> and this one here, of course, is the James Bond car that we're all very excited about. What's it like to drive a, a it's car that's... actually that's... not difficult. The earlier ones were very much more difficult with the clutch and what have you. There's no doubt that the DB5 is a true classic of British motor manufacturing. But if Adam's grandfather hadn't brought Aston Martin, it's unlikely to have been the worldwide icon we know today. How did the fact that uh, David Brown had a successful tractor uh, a company affect the advancement of the Aston Martin when he bought the company? Uh, the Aston Martin uh, guys maybe wouldn't like me to say this, but the tractor engineers were, were quite ahead of their, their game and they did help uh, tuning the engines and indeed making sure the racing gearboxes were up to speed. You'd never think, would you, that uh, uh, the makers of a tractor would end up uh, facilitating a, 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 a fast uh, a car. I, I, I suppose you've just got to think of the, the man, David Brown, mm. because he was a, a racing driver, really, at heart, uh, and the tractors were not, not a way to get to the car, but they were, they were viewed as a sports car in his, in his mentality, I think. I'd like nothing more than to get behind the wheel of such an iconic British car, but unfortunately for me, Chris has driving ambitions of his own. It will come as some surprise that I have never actually auditioned or played James Bond. But I did play, I know, it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. good for you. But I did play James Herriot, and I am licensed to drive a tractor. Please, may I have a go? Is that allowed? Of course you can, yeah. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Yourself. Very much your thank you. Thank you very much, good thank luck. you. I told a little fib to Lady Diana, if truth be known, I have never driven a tractor in my life. If truth be known, Chris, I think Lady Diana's probably worked that out. Hello. Whoa. What do you think? To the manor born. <laughs> He enjoyed himself on the tractor. It was fun to watch him do a circuit, his head going along the top of the wall, and uh, he, he, he got back, he arrived back. That's the important thing with Chris, if he turns up again. Having ridden a vintage tractor and uncovered a fascinating piece of post-war Yorkshire motoring history, we jump back into the Morgan and make progress along our homecoming Harriet Trail. Did you imagine that all creatures would be that well, successful. But he was huge, wasn't he? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We did yeah. I mean, we both heard uh, that first review. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, I <laughs> broke, Where, my, broke my heart. Well, they had a vet. They got a vet. The uh, veterinary advisor at London Zoo. Right. And he said, oh, who wants to listen? Who wants to watch a programme about vets? No one is going to find this programme interesting. About three weeks later, vicars were changing church service times to accommodate the uh, people who weren't coming to church because of the show. Do you think, do you think, imagine, we'd still know each other or be friends all this time later? I don't know. I just knew we were mates. That yeah. was, yeah. I'm surprised well, we were still alive all this time later, actually. I sometimes wonder if I still am. <laughs> <laughs> We've some way to go before we reach the place where our friendship started. And before we get there, we're going to cross the epic beauty of the North York Moors. This place became like a second home. I think of it as almost as a, a second home. The fact that Harriet and his kind, these were the areas they went in the, in the bleakest part of winter. Yes. Who'd be a vet, eh? Absolutely. A pretend vet is fine. <laughs> Almost 30 miles into our trip, we've reached the North York Moors, a beautiful but desolate landscape that is largely unchanged since Harriet's time. 
We're on our way to visit a coaching inn that would have been familiar to James Herriot. Standing several miles from the nearest house and 1,325 feet above sea level, the Lion Inn is one of the remotest inns in the country and was popular with pioneer motorists in the 1920s and 30s. Nowadays, it often serves classic car enthusiasts, just like us, who love to get off the beaten track. Morning. This bunch are fans of Jowett cars, Yorkshire's very own car manufacturing company. Hello. Hi, uh, Hello, Dan. Hi. How are you? Nice to meet you. Peter. Peter, I'm Noel. Hi, Chris. Oh, Hi, Noel. Hi, Chris. Chris and I were talking earlier about the, uh, 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 the, the traits of a, of a typical Yorkshireman, proud. And it seems to me that the Jowett car it personifies that absolutely to a T. Yeah. Yeah. The Jowett brothers, that their philosophy was to make affordable, cheap cars that the average man in the street could afford to buy, but as rugged and well-built as possible. I mean, all the, all the mechanicals are, are good quality stuff. They didn't cut corners. If, if it was too pricey, they'd have been, they'd have been saying, how much? <laughs> <laughs> These are proper Yorkshire cars owned by Yorkshire people. I mean, they are quirky. And, and it suits Yorkshire people, because I think we're pretty quirky on, on, on average. Uh, the Javelin is post-war? It's post-war, yeah. OK. Yeah. And why do they look like 1930s gangster cars? <laughs> because they do, don't they? The, yeah. the front is like straight out of American comics. Well, well Ger it's, They're fantastic, I think. Uh, Gerald Palmer, who designed the Javelin, uh, he had worked at um, MG uh, before the war, and Jowett's headhunted him in 1942 and yeah. said, we can design whatever you like. And he came out with that? Yeah. I, th I think we should go and have a look at, actually, some of the cars. That's great, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank really, you. amazing. While Chris goes to check out the cars, I've spotted more club members who I want to chat with. How are you? How are you? How are you? I wanted to come and talk to you because I want to get the real story about how you feel. You are the Jowettesses, is that right? Yes. So how do you, how do you feel about your partners? Uh, um, having this hobby. I do a lot of praying <laughs> that we'll get to our destination <laughs> and, a lot of and home again. Oh, yeah. yes. And you have a smile on your face. <laughs> it's more gritted teeth, Peter, actually. <laughs> well, I yes. just love it. Yes. Everybody helps one another. Yes, yes it's a very you friendly contact, car club. Yeah. And with Noel, it's, it's very much with a little help from his friends or a lot of help from his friends. Yeah. When I get yeah. in Joey, everybody waves to you and you always find an elderly lady or gentleman attached to it saying, I used to have one of yes. these. Yeah. I learned to drive in yes. one of these. Yeah. Well, it's lovely to meet you all. <laughs> very, very, you very beautiful selection of cars. And ladies. Oh, well, thank, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Having leapt back into the Morgan, smooth-talking Peter Davison and I leave the Jowett Car Club behind and continue our journey to Harriet country. Well, I don't think you can get much better than that. Agree. Uh, um, Agree. A collection of Yorkshire Jowets written by Yorkshire people in the middle of the Yorkshire Moors. <laughs> They're keeping history alive. Absolutely. And they love it, don't they? While we're on our own Harriet Trail adventure, James wasn't the only one to put pen to paper about this unique county. I've got a quote from Daniel Defoe. 1724, yeah. and when he was passing through the Dales, this is what he wrote. Nor were these hills high and formidable only, but they had a kind of inhospitable terror in them, all barren and wild, and of no use or advantage either to man or beast. It's funny how our attitudes have uh, changed towards uh, scenery uh, and uh, uh, um, the countryside, especially the, the, the wild end of the countryside. The, uh, you know, now it's what it's what we look for, isn't it? We look for that, that untouched. Well, the dramatic and the yeah, they untouched by man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred years ago, and, uh, it used to be that this sort of scenery wasn't really what you wanted to see. It was too, too raw. As we continue to travel across the moors, the wide open spaces give way to narrow lanes and picturesque villages, which are becoming increasingly tricky to drive. Whoa! Yeah, this is quite, this is quite steep. I don't think I'm going to make this in second gear even. I might have to go into first. 
Well, we've really got an even trickier bit of road ahead, it looks to me. Oh, look at this. There we go, fast. Oh! <laughs> no, I think it looks worse than this. The piece of road Chris is referring to is the Rosedale Chimney, one of the steepest roads in Britain. It got its name from the 100-foot chimney marking the location of a Victorian ironstone mine. In the early 20th century, it was the site of a popular motorsport event which up to 15,000 spectators came to watch. Whoa, it's fast again. In preparation for tackling it ourselves, we're meeting local expert Paul to find out more about this daunting road and race which both have a fascinating history. Hello. Hello, Paul. Hi, Paul. Hi, Paul. Chris. Chris. Hi. Nice I'm very well, thank you. Nice to meet you. So uh, the road ahead does look a bit tricky. It is a tricky hill. It was used as a hill climb venue. It was unmade, untarmacked, very rough, one in four, one in three and a half. And races used to start from the pub car park here and go half a mile up the hill. They had crowds of 10, 12, 15,000 watching the event really? here. That many? That many. And when were they held? Always on a Sunday, which caused some controversy. There was a church service held on the hill before the event. The local vicar, the <coughs> Reverend Clarkson Birch, was stood on the hill and had a heroic photograph of addressing the crowds or the congregation. I brought along an order of service, complete with hymns, finishing up with Onward Christian Soldiers, probably a very appropriate hymn. <laughs> Onward, Christian, so we know that, don't we? I know the first verse. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Paul, uh, um, for telling us all that, and yeah. wish us luck, because are we going to have a go at this? Yes. Well, I am. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to buckle up, fire up the Morgan, and take on the legendary Rosedale chimney. Thunderbirds are go. OK, Chris. We're going to give this beast a go, OK? Yeah, can't uh, wait. I don't think there'll be a cup waiting for us, but maybe uh, a big array. Oh! <laughs> I love the hell. Woo! Into first gear! Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war. With the cross of Jesus going on before the, the tarmac on the road was probably more help than the hymns, but we've made it to the top. Well, that was, um, that was good. You could have done it faster. I'm glad you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Conquered the Rosedale chimney, we motor on towards Heriot country, and the landscape brings back some fond driving memories. This road reminds me very slightly of, uh, do you remember what we used to affectionately call the yellow brick road? Absolutely. We used to end up driving it quite late at night in the pitch black. The road was full of twists and turns, and if you, you weren't careful, you'd end up off the road. But also, being townies, the last thing we wanted to do was run over a rabbit, so you'd be driving across the yellow brick road, pitch black. Some rabbit would be sitting in the middle of the road, and rather than just drive straight over the top of it, it would swerve off. In the golden age of motoring, dark roads like the one Chris and I used to drive on after filming were commonplace and provided the inspiration for a Yorkshire motoring revolution that was exported around the world. Legend has it that one foggy night, businessman Percy Shaw was driving on the wrong side of the road and was saved from a serious crash by seeing a cat's eyes which revealed where he was. Cat's eyes, along with Jowett Cars and David Brown's ownership of Aston Martin, form part of Yorkshire's rich motoring heritage. But as we approach the Dales, we're closing in on one of the county's most incredible natural creations. Sutton Bank overlooks where James Herriot used to live and work and offers what the man himself called the finest view in England. We've come to take a look for ourselves and meet a man I know well, his son, Jim. <laughs> How are you, mate? It's so good to see you. Yeah. Fantastic. Nice to see you. Oh, really nice to see good to see, see you. you. Really good. We've both played pretend vets, right? And we, 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 we appreciate all the things involved in everything, but 
You were the son of the world's most famous vet. My only claim to fame, yes. <laughs> oh, come now, come now. Yeah. But tell me about that, please. Tell yeah, well, I, I used to go around in the car with him from the age of three. Um, By the time I was five, I reckon I was pretty well qualified. You know, <laughs> I'd seen it all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What is this view? Look at it. Extraordinary. This was his favourite walk along here. My father always had time when he was at his busiest to walk his dogs. All through 60s, 70s, 80s, my dad would walk his dog. You're looking down on where he lived, you're looking down on his practice, and you're looking across to all creatures great and small country. So his desire for anonymity, was that the only, was that the only reason he chose a pen name? Was well, he honest? wasn't allowed to use his name, because in those days there was a thing called veterinary etiquette. You were not allowed to advertise. And if he'd use his name, it was construed as advertising. Yeah. So we had to look for a pen name, and every time he thought of one, there was a vet called that name, because there's a veterinary register about this thick, you know, there's thousands of us. <laughs> and, if, and then he was watching a football match one night, and it was Birmingham City versus Manchester United, and in goal for Birmingham is a goalkeeper called Jim Herriot. Yeah. And the dad reached yet again for the register, and no vet called Herriot. Why, what do you think struck a chord? Because it's one thing to find this uh, scenery beautiful, as your father obviously did, and then to want to write these stories, but to be that successful, it must have been a terrific surprise to him, I'd have thought. Yeah. But what, why did it well, I know why his books, such a note? Well, one of the big reasons his books are so successful, I always say this, it's not just about animals. James Herriot's books are about people. And I think he, he described the characters so well, and you portrayed them so well in the television series, and people are interested in people, and I think this is why the television series was so successful. But to go back to the 40s and 50s like that, had huge appeal for people. A total okay. pleasure. Yeah. Well, lovely always. to see you, Chris. You too, always mate. nice to see you. It was great to catch up with Jim. And as we head off, we're driving down the hill from Sutton Bank. You so, you possibly have a look out that window and see if anything's coming. Oh, but sleep on. Um, if I can, look and you're right. It won't be long now before we arrive in the place where our 40-year friendship began. And now, the story really begins. We spent many years working amidst this incredible landscape. It was always full of slightly quirky and unexpected surprises, and we we're on our way to uncover another. In the late 1940s, the British government began distributing invalid cars to disabled people. By the 1970s, there were over 20,000 of them on the roads. We've come to meet a man who's got one of the largest collections of invalid cars and carriages in the world. Hi. Simon, is it? Peter. Yeah, how are you? Hi, Simon. Chris. Chris, nice to meet you. You too. Thank you, nice to meet you, too. Simon, Thank you for coming. You have a collection of what I know as uh, invalid cars. That's right, yeah. That, and how did, you, how did you come to have an interest in these? Um, it started with my grandfather. Right. So my grandfather was a disabled person. Mm -hmm. And after World War II, the government started to, through the NHS, give disabled people mm. uh, mobility and, and, and independence through carriages mm. like these. Right, yes. Now, obviously, we have three of them. Your examples here, you have many more. How many do you have altogether? About 20. About 20. But this, of course, is the one that I, I recognise. Yes. And, uh, uh, we used to see many of these yes. uh, around on the roads. The government phased these out in, in 1975. They phased them out over a long period. But in, the, but in 1975, there was around about 25,000 disabled invalid carriage uh, vehicles on the road. And they were using these uh, all over the country. It was a, a, a revolutionary scheme that came with the the revolution of the NHS, yeah. basically. How reliable were they? Bear in mind, there's no spare wheel. There's no, there's, in the early vehicles, there's no petrol gauge. It's yeah. absurd, isn't it? Yeah, there was, the absurdity of it is part of the historic interest. Yeah, in yeah, it. yeah. You know, it's, but they're not a comedy. They're not, they're not, it's not comedy, it's not a joke. No, absolutely. Because, because literally, in the world, we pr the British government provided, albeit a very strange solution, yes. A solution, solution for independence for, for disabled people, which in no other country was completed on this scale. So in fairness, the real answer is not terribly reliable. Terribly unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you That's... speak on behalf of disabled people? Because if you don't, I reckon you should start. <laughs> I really disabled. do. I'm disabled. I, I, I have deafness. I've broken a lot of bones. I have a, a, a bone condition, so I've broken about 140 bones. So disability is a big part of what I do. Thank you very much for showing them to us, Simon. And you're a social historian. 
trying to be. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you yeah. for coming. You're doing silly. Thanks for having us. Back in the Morgan, we're closing in rapidly on Heriot country. Our old stomping ground will be packed full of wonderful memories. But before we arrive, we have a slight issue to resolve in the navigation department. Where are we? Do you know where we are? Well, I just saw a sign for Beedell, and I can't remember what it, how many miles that was. Yeah, you're holding so the map, Chris. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> I know. So you don't know when we're going to cross over. You can't tell me. I can't remember. You can't say to me, Peter, we're about to cross over the A1 into Heriot. It's you quite likely that I will recognise it when we get there. <laughs> OK? OK. I can't believe it. We've come to another traffic light. They're all temporary traffic lights. Do you think they just put them up to annoy us? It's usually roadworks, isn't it? Isn't it? Or these are one of those roadworks where there aren't actually any people working on the road. And that is so rare, isn't it? So rare. <laughs> Back on the move, and thankfully having located where we are on the map, it's not long before we arrive at perhaps the most exclusive stop on our exploration of Yorkshire's rich motoring history and classic car culture. That Chris is a steam car. That's extraordinary. Oh, this is exciting. The car we've come to see is an American Stanley Model M. It's one of the only two working models in the world and belongs to steam car enthusiast Harold. Harold! Yes, good morning. Harold, it's very nice to Hello, see you. Peter. How are you? I'm all right. Hello, Harold. Nice to meet you. I'm Chris. Yes, Hi. thank you. Pleased to meet you. I don't know what I was expecting, but not this. It's magnificent. Yeah, it truly is. And so clean. I don't want to touch it even. I'm yeah, you're OK. Am I OK? <laughs> I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, a rag to polish it up later. <laughs> OK, that's a deal. <laughs> is it easy to drive? Um, once, once it's all prepared and ready and in steam, it's right. relatively simple because you would just need to steer it, use the throttle, we need to keep an eye on the water gauge, yeah. and then we need to keep an eye on the winker, right. and then we keep an eye on a little pyrometer so we know the fire's lit. Right. And then if you get time, you have a look where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have a go in it? I'll take you right, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay. Well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Harold's car holds 35 gallons of water, giving it a range of around 35 miles. The steam was once produced by burning paraffin, but nowadays he uses a petrol and diesel mix. Right. Oh, listen. What? That's it sounds like a train. <laughs> I know, it does. The engine is exactly the same as a train. Right. Uh, let's say you were to wake up in the morning and uh, decide I want to have a little, uh, a little drive around in my steam car. How long would it take you to get it ready to go? It's about between 20 and 25 minutes. All right. How old is the car? When well, was it built? 1908, and they only made 75 of them. It was too expensive in its day. <laughs> $2,000 for the, for the very bare car. Right. Didn't even have a speed on lights at that. And so obviously it had a very exclusive uh, clientele, presumably. Only the very rich, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, by the time you put your extras on, you're probably looking at $2,500 in 1908. What's the, what's the top speed of this? It will actually do 70 miles an hour. Really? Uh, I wouldn't like to be doing 70 miles an hour. No, it's only got back brakes as well. Has it really? Yes. Their sales literature said it would, uh, a car capable of 70 miles an hour, as long as the roads are suitable to do it. So it was the roads that were the problem. And were there any roads that were suitable to do it? There can't be many. Not, not many, I yeah. don't think, no. But it does do 70, we've done it. Time to see what Harold Stanley Model M can do. Woo -hoo! Elegant way of travelling. It oh, it's better than that. Yes. And now we're going to get back in the Morgan. Well, I'm going to suggest that we scrap the Morgan and we finish the trip in this. <laughs> I think I've Harold... never been so comfortable ever. I think Harold might have something to say about that. <laughs> fantastic, Harold. Thank you. You're very welcome. Really fantastic. This is a way to travel, isn't it? The age of the steam-powered car was relatively short-lived, but Harold Stanley Model M is undeniable proof that he produced some remarkable vehicles. That wasn't that a fantastic way to be transported. I've never known such comfort. Yeah. It was elegant. Yeah, it was. absolutely. It just sounded so much like being in a very genteel steam train. That's right, I know. 
As we motor on, we're on the very edge of the Yorkshire Dales, which have played such a big part in mine and Peter's lives. Passing under the A1, I'm behind the wheel for the moment we've both been waiting for. We are now in Harriet country. Yes. And you know, it smells different. I don't care who says it, it there's a difference. Mm. Peter and I filmed seven series of All Creatures Great and Small in the Yorkshire Dales, and many of its towns and villages hold fond memories. The house where I spent that first week of veterinary training... Oh, yes. ..before filming started... Right. ..is up here on the right, and I'm 99% certain it was that one. On that the house. On the court, yeah. And that's where I, that's where I met um, Jack and Jess. Jack Watkinson is the man who gave me my veterinary training. I lived with him, his wife Jess, and his children for seven eventful days while he did his best to make me into a credible TV vet. Jack sadly no longer with us, but his son John has followed in his father's footsteps, and we're dropping in on him at work. Aww. Hello. Hi, John. Hi, Peter. Hi, John. Hi, Hi Chris. Nice to see you. How are you doing? Very well. Good to see you. How are you doing? Yeah, good. 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 Uh, what did you know, Dad ever mention what he thought of this, this city boy turning up? He, apparently in a denim jacket, denim trousers, white moccasin shoes. Chris and father got on quite well, which yeah. is fair to say. And there were totally different backgrounds, different personalities. And it rather surprised us when we were kids how well they got on. Mm. Uh, considering that you were from two different worlds, really, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We literally went out and he said, uh, he, said have, have, he looked at my attire and said, have you got any boots? And I have. I brought up a brand new pair of wellies, proper wellies. So I put the wellies on and got in the car and we went, we went off on, on the, his rounds, our afternoon visits. First was a cat with bad breath, which was in... in and everything about it was James Herriot. Yeah. The lady, the house, the furniture. She was sweet and charming. Your dad was delightful. And then there was a cow who wouldn't get up. Jack got hold of the tail, right, and stood behind it. Get up, yeah, up, up, And the cow got up without so much as a buy your leave, and mm. off it trotted. Mm. So I remember thinking... Cruel to be kind. Yeah, exactly. And then there was a carving. And at the end, when the calf was cleaned up and strawed up and breathing and on it, tottering on its feet, I just saw Jack and he was clearly quite moved. Yeah, there's always uh, an element of satisfaction. Exactly. And that, that's still the case to this day. You know? yeah. And even the farmers who see it absolutely day in, day out, I think they get a bit of a kick from it still. It's been really good to see you, John. Thank you. Bye. Being in Yorkshire and catching up with probably one of the most influential times in my life, for me, is... Um, it's very, it's very touching and, and quite moving, and it's, it's second only to the reactions I feel when I go back to work. It was really great to see John again, and as we drive off, more memories come flooding back. I remember the first time we filmed here, I knew the books had been successful, but there was not a soul around, and people really weren't that interested in no. us filming, were they? We, we got in their way at the bay. Yeah, we got in their way and there was yeah. always, we would have to hold the traffic in Askrig. Right, so we're driving down the hill now into Askrig. The whole of the first, that first filming block, not a soul was here. The second block... You couldn't move. Couldn't move. And that coach parties, everything. The village of Askrig is right in the heart of Heriot country. On screen, the King's Arms pub became the Drover's Arms and Scaledale House, which nowadays is a B&B, &B, was used as the exterior for our vet's practice and home. <laughs> I feel like we found the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that day we did a, we did a scene and uh, across the road there must have been at least 200 tourists, I think from Canada, I think. A and, coach party. Yeah, at least two or three coaches, right, and they were all over there and we were all get gathered we came out we said a few lines and a lady dressed perfectly for the period walked across and would have been fine except she was carrying a plastic carrier bag and cut and she looked at the crowd looked at us and she said i've got my bloody life to lead you know <laughs> and it's the truth isn't it i mean well, she was obviously going to yeah. get get a husband's lunch or something
They're looking out their windows now and thinking, oh, no, they're back. After spending the night in the village of Ash Creek, we're now heading out on the final leg of our journey. That is, if the locals will let us get money. There's a dog on the road. Hello. Good dog. Needs to be a vet, you know. So now we're almost at the end of our Yorkshire trip. Yes. What's been your favourite bit? I love the, uh, you driving the tractor, especially the disembodied head going along the top of the wall. Uh, and oh, you, that's what it looked like, did it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. Yes. OK. And, of course, the steam car, that was fun. Yeah, it was, I agree. Uh, but I suppose, for me, the best bit must be, you know, when we actually cross the A1 into the Dales proper. That's where it began all those years ago, isn't it? I um, absolutely agree. Yeah. 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 Magical times. Yeah. Driving through the beautiful Yorkshire Dales, we're closing in on the village of Langthwaite, the location of the opening scenes of All Creatures Great and Small, where we're going to recreate what are perhaps the series' most famous scenes. Oh, Langthwaite, opening credits of All Creatures. Oh, in the Austin 7. Yeah, my first car was an Austin 7. A parent's first car was an Austin 7. Oh, get on. Really? Well, what a coincidence. Here we go. To mark the end of an incredible journey, and to celebrate our 40-year friendship, we've borrowed an Austin 7 to recreate the opening titles of the show that transformed our lives. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. That was fun. Look at this. Bit nice, isn't it? Yes. Now, this was Siegfried's, um, or very similar to Siegfried's car in the first series. Let's just spin. Why not? No, 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 you drive, you drive. You be Siegfried. Come. Introduced in 1922, the Austin 7 was at first derided for its tiny, compact design and low power. Yeah. Got it. But it wasn't long before the low price tag and low fuel consumption endeared the car to the public, soon earning the nickname Baby Austin. This was a small car with a big influence that made motoring accessible to the lower middle classes. Yeah. We are now going to reenact the opening sequence of all creatures, great and small. Okay. You realise I have you no. Are, you realise I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay? I'll show you. You are Siegfried, and I'm Jane. In 1977, I drove the roads in and around Langthwaite with Robert Hardy. Now I'm going to drive them again with my mate of over 40 years. number of people who came up for at least a year after that, if not more, and said, when you were Robert Hardy, you were laughing. What were you laughing about? And I said, we were laughing. We, I can't tell you what we were laughing about without offending you, because it was nothing to do with the series, nothing to do with vets. It was something slightly untoward that, <laughs> that Robert Hardy said that made me laugh. The journey along our own Heriot Trail has been truly fantastic, and revisiting the places where our friendship began all those years ago has been an unforgettable experience. I've got to say, I am really, really glad that we've done Yorkshire, and I'm really even gladder that we're sort of reaching the end in the part of Yorkshire that we knew so well, don't yes, you think? Yeah. A, gra a rare experience, and it's fantastic. This is perfect, because this is the, this is the, 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 the location that we used to use when you, when you had those moments of uh, I, I know you don't like the word sentimentality, but, but reflection. Were, they're sentimental scenes, and, and when we were go, uh, uh, going off to war, yeah, we'd yeah, yeah. do a scene, and it would just create such a fantastic backdrop uh, and make it all the more poignant. Absolutely. But it is stunning, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. What a, what a great experience, eh? Another 40 years we'll come back again, shall we? Well, no. Yeah. You can push me. Hmm?